everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Nicholas Nickleby Mini Review Series, brought to you by Cup of Hemlock Theater. I am your marketing manager and host, co-host, really, Mackenzie. You can and be the I'm, host, it's fine. I'm happy to be sure. the guest on these. All right, all right. And I'm joined by my co-producer of all things, The Cup, the man who thought up this little uh, nine-part mini-series. Mr. Ryan Barakovich. Hello, Ryan. Hello, Meg. You're now on the penultimate episode of mm. this of this Mammoth Up shows. The big reveal that I've been waiting for Ryan to see. All right. <laughs> but before we get into that, what's in your cup? Oh my goodness, yes. Well, as always, there's a cup of Earl Grey tea in my The Cup Cup. And I have a little tankard of water as well. <laughs> what about you, good sir? I love this one's a little today. early in the morning, so I have coffee in my The Cup Ooh. Cup. I'm not a coffee person, so that's why even in early mornings I'll always drink a cup of tea yeah. or, or if anything. I try to limit myself to one coffee per day, which is usually right away when I wake up. So the fact that this one's early means it's a coffee one. <laughs> ah, very good. Very good. Well, it's going to be a full day, I can tell you. After after this is done, I, I my day scheduled almost down to the minute. Okay. With what I, with what I gotta do. So then let's a, dive oh, right into it. Like in this, I'm kind of like Nicholas in this episode, running every which way, <laughs> left, right, and center. Yes. Well, very dramatically. Well, let's dive right into it, shall we? Yes, let's. Ryan, give us a quick elevator pitch summary of what happened last time, and give us a summary of what happened this time. Yeah. Okay. So last time I hated everything. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the summary. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so last time, last episode was the real big mess episode. We're coming right off of the the coattails of Smite being re-kidnapped by the Squeers. Mm -hmm. We had, again, this is short elevator pitch version. Bob, what a guy, comes in and saves Smite in like the first 10 minutes of the episode and immediately... Did you say Bob? Yeah, Bob Peck, the actor who is. Oh, you know, yes, John. Sorry, I'm just saying, I'm just saying it's, it's John. Yeah. Not Bob. Yeah, the character is John. I, in my mind, I switch back and forth between the two of them. Yeah, Bob Peck, aka John, final use character names. Yeah. <laughs> uh, John swoops in and saves Smike, really extinguishing all of the tension and goodwill <laughs> that had built up at the end of the previous episode. Um, and yeah, then a bunch of other stuff happens. Um, we have this whole kind of subplot going on with uh, Ralph. Ralph and his colleague, Mr. Goblin, who this, in this episode, he actually gets a name, Mr. Gride. Uh, yes. um, but yeah, so Ralph and his colleague, the Goblin, I'm still just going to call him the Goblin. Um, are, we, also, we also have the mysterious man in the night that's, that's yeah. accosting Ralph as well. Yeah, his so, big Javert moment under the bridge. Yeah, so Ralph... Someone from Ralph's past is trying to bring a reckoning upon him, but we're not quite sure why yet. Yep. And still, at this episode, we're not quite sure why yet. Um, yep. And then, yeah, Ralph is helping his business colleague, Mr. Goblin, extort Nicholas's love interest, kind of. They barely know each other. But Nicholas's love interest, Madeline, into marriage to relieve her father's debts. Yes. Um <laughs> We, we yeah had a really awkward scene wedged in the middle of Nicholas telling Noggs how he's in love with this girl he barely knows, and then we have only after that get his first conversation with her, yeah. and everything's just really awkward between them. And not in the book, they have way. more conversations. Okay, and more than what we saw in the show. So the adaptation has made that bit worse. Got it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, and so then. Uh, yeah, the, the Nickelbees throw, like, a little dinner party soiree to, uh, you know, thank John <laughs> and Tilda for saving Smike. And then who happens to crash that party? Why, it's Ralph and Mr. Squeers and Mr. Snarly. Yeah. And uh, they have come with the big shocking reveal that they have uncovered that Smike is actually the long-lost child of Mr. Snarly. And therefore, he's going to take his son back, but uh, and immediately send him back to the, the Yorkshire home run by the Squeers. So yep. that seems to have worked out. Also, we know that Ralph is doing all of this because he wants to hurt Nicholas personally for yes. all of the troubles he's put him through. The hearts! <laughs> go for the hearts! Yeah, so he, has, he has his goblin moment there. <laughs> um, 
so yeah, but Smike kind of puts his foot down and says, I am home. And so he doesn't want to go with Snolly. And then Nicholas and Kate, and especially John, stand up to them all and be like, get out of here. We don't want you. Um, True. And yeah, Ralph monologues about, oh, Nicholas, you thought this boy was a special. You had some um, romantic notions about his parentage when it turns out he's nothing but a poor boy from a poor family. Spare him his life from this monstrosity. I was about um, to say, are we going to be a queen now? <laughs> yes. Uh, that's basically what he said. Direct quote. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, then the episode, uh, the previous episode ended on this I guess, cliffhanger, and we'll talk about why there's a big asterisk on that. Uh, uh, there's sort of the two kind of couples remaining at the soiree. Yeah. One of them was Mr. Lincoln Water, who's flirting with Miss LaPrevy. And, Damn you, Tim Lincoln Water! <laughs> yeah, and uh, Frank Cherable, who we also met for the first time in that episode, the nephew of the Cherable brothers. Yes. Uh, he's sticking behind to flirt with Kate. And who yeah. was very sad about that? Why it's poor old Smike who's longingly staring from afar in his little cupboard underneath the stairs. Oh <laughs> my old. Yes. Um, so yeah, that was the previous episode in a nutshell. I skipped over the part with the Kenwigs because it's stupid. Um, Not and, so stupid. We got more of them. Well, episode. that's extra stupid, and we'll get to that in the summary <laughs> that I'm about yes. to give now. Okay, so this episode, episode eight, the penultimate episode of our genealogy. Um, anyway, so we have an episode on Mr. Goblin, and yeah. he's planning his wedding, and he's sorting through his papers, and he has a conversation with his servant, landlady, I don't know what exactly her role is in his life, but Peg. Maid. Yeah, it's, it, yeah, it's it's his it's his maid. Okay, so Peg, who's this kind of decrepit hunchback lady with, I couldn't tell if she's supposed to be Welsh or she has some kind of accent. <laughs> I thought she was blind. Blind? Oh, maybe. I don't know. They they didn't Something's do a going lot. On with their, they yeah. didn't do a lot to characterize her. Um, she just kind of shows up, and yells at the goblin. She has a very distinct look. She kind of looks like the hags from Mackers. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she she just, like, again, she's in this whole thing for, like, maybe 30 seconds tops. She just shows up, yells at Mr. Goblin. He yells at her, but also kind of flirts with her. It's sort of weird. He tells her about his plans to marry Madeline, and I guess he intends for the three of them to have this kind of weird throuple dynamic. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but whatever, they, they have this banter. And then who happens to show up? Well, it's Mr. Newman Hogs because, yeah, we can't go more than 10 seconds without him showing up everywhere. <laughs> yeah, he, he does crack his knuckles in this scene. And he delivers a letter from Ralph to the Goblin. And so Goblin reads it privately. He's like, oh, yes, excellent. Yeah. And the letter basically implies or suggests that the wedding is going to happen tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Um, yeah. So uh, the goblins wants to celebrate his good tidings by having a drink with Newman. Um, but yeah, so while he's getting the drink, Newman peters over the letter and sees, oh no, the marriage to Madeline. That's the girl that Nicholas loves and it's happening tomorrow. I need to go warn my very best friend and or crush. Yes. Um, so um, yeah, so anyway, we'll skip over the part where they have their drink together. It doesn't really move the plot forward. No. <laughs> So then, yeah, cut to Newman warning Nicholas that uh, the wedding is happening, and Nicholas is out of his mind. He's crazy. He doesn't know who he's got to punch, but he's going to punch someone. <laughs> and, then, and then Newman says probably my favorite line in this entire thing so far, right after Nicholas leaves. He, he's not going to punch anyone just yet. First, kind of Newman talks him down a little bit, but Nicholas is like, oh, okay, I gotta talk to Madeline, because clearly she will not stand for this, and this is all being, you know, orchestrated behind her back, so I'll start by talking to her and or her father, and then if that doesn't work, I'll punch her father and or the goblin, I guess. <laughs> and so, and then, yeah, Nog says my favorite line in this whole thing is he's a violent man. He has a violent streak. Still, I like him for it. End quote. <laughs> uh, that is just... I, okay, let's skip ahead slightly to the adaptation check-in. Is that line in the book? Because if it is, well done, Mr. Dickens. If not, well done, Mr. Edgar. I can't, uh, <laughs> I can't 
can't remember. I'll, ha- I'll, I'll, I'll have to skim through my online copies because I've listened to the audiobook. Yeah. So, like, so, like, so you keep talking, I'll look it up. Okay, well. I think I know what chapter it's in, so I can easily... Uh, so yeah. I think, I think it was in chapter 53. So give me a minute like, to skim through while you... I, I just love it yeah. because, well, one, it's hanging a lampshade on the thing that I've been kind of harping on this whole time. Like, man, our protagonist sort of just solved all of his problems by punching people. Isn't that kind of weird? Like, he's... He's the dumb jock of his own story, and yet we're supposed to root for him for it. <laughs> um, and yeah, the, the kind of just that, but still I like him for it is, on one hand, it's, you know, continuing my queer reading of Nogs, which I, I yes. stand. Um, it's, you know, <laughs> Nogs is kind of just into the brute violence of his crush, Nicholas. Uh, but on the other hand, I kind of feel like this line in addition to hanging the lampshade on the violence that underpins Nicholas's character, it it is, you know, Nogs has always sort of been, I think, if not an audience POV or circuit character, he's certainly a kind of moral center voice of reason character that we're supposed to identify with, I think. Bob Cratchit. Yeah. The very he, well, drunk version of Bob Cratchit. Yeah, he's definitely Bob Cratchit, you know, and so far as he definitely, you know, he's the employee of the bad, bad rich man. But, uh, but yeah, what I do, like, I just think it's really funny that putting this, you know, acknowledgement of Nicholas's violent tendencies in the mouth of okay. someone who's... Okay, I found the line. Mm-hmm. So, so Nog says, he says, he's a violent youth at, at times, said Newman, looking, uh, looking after him, and yet I like him for it. There's cause enough n- now, or the do or 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 um deduce is um yeah uh, uh, is in it. Hope I said hope I think Ralph Nickleby and and Gride will uh, uh uh will their heads together, and I hope for the opposite party. Ho ho. Okay, so yeah, so okay, good job, Dave Edgar. Similar for Good job, Dave Edgar, for cutting it down because we didn't need all of that. <laughs> yes. But but what I do just like about it so much is well, like again, I have mixed feelings about it as with everything kind of in this whole production. But I like I like how they're trying to use this you know identifiable audience POV esque character to kind of brush aside the violence here that like oh well he has cause for his violence and you know what don't we all kind of like him for it didn't we all sort of have a good time when he punched spears in the face that one time like yeah. it's it's i just think it's very meta it's very on the nose it it certainly breaks the fourth wall and it's yeah. it is very much author speaking directly to audience yeah he's violent yeah. but that's why we like him <laughs> And like, while I don't necessarily agree with that reading, I think it's very funny to put that line in Nons' mouth. <laughs> yeah. So Nicholas, continuing onward, runs over to Mr. Bray, and he brings prematurely another order for, of the charitables' money, hoping that he can kind of prevent the wedding from happening. But Mr. Bray is not having it, because now that my daughter is getting married to this rich man, I have no need for your charity and your charitables. Um, if I were a rich man. Yeah, so he rips the order, which, like, dude, <laughs> you know, what is the point of even having a business or whatever? I don't, I don't, I still don't think, know exactly. Get, whatever, they're selling off their stuff, right? Just okay. to kind of get Okay, off. is that what, okay, I feel like that wasn't yeah. made very clear. Like, um, Yeah, that's why, like, um, Nicholas came and bought the chairs and the end tables. Stuff. Okay, I thought he was Find a chair maker. I don't know. Of all the things no. that have been cut. No. No, 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 no. He's like an invalid in a wheelchair. Yeah, I don't know. You can still make chairs in a wheelchair. Don't, you know, don't limit him. Um, <laughs> anyway, so, fine. So, okay, that actually makes this make more sense than I was thinking it did. So he, t- now that his daughter is getting married to a rich old goblin, he doesn't need this charity and he rips up the orders from the charitables and kind of yells at Nicholas to go away. Yeah. But Nicholas is like, you know, he's starting to lose his temper, which only aggravates Mr. Bray more, and he's going to leave, but Madeline sort of sticks behind to talk to him about, like, oh, you're being very cruel to my old sick father. And uh, he, you know, Nicholas tells, tips her off that the marriage is set to happen tomorrow, and we need to do something to stop it. But she reveals that, quote, this evil is of my own seeking, end quote, which devastates Nicholas when she tells him that she not only knows that this is happening, but she consents to it. And he, you know, has no place to think of himself as the knight in shining armor who's going to save yeah. her from 
the thing that she's already decided to do and is going to save her family. So, yeah. Uh, so that, yeah, that exchange happens. I thought that was actually pretty interesting. Kind of puts Nicholas in his place sort of for once. Um, but then the play still seems to take Nicholas's side then. Oh, he's in the right and she's deluded and probably hysterical. Women, right? Victorian women. <laughs> um... So then, oh, and things get spicy here, we cut over to our good friends Mulberry Hawk and Lord Frederick. Also, sidebar, I feel like I've been pronouncing his name wrong this whole time. It's Mr. Hawk, not Hawks. Um, I, I, so apologies to the ghost of Charles Dickens, I guess. <laughs> um, uh, also, like, I, I was having a moment of, is is which one's his first name? Is it Hawk or is it Mulberry? Because Sir Mulberry Hawk. Yeah, which is what I thought, which is why I've been mistakenly calling him Hawks. Mr. Hawks, like that's his surname. Singular now, whatever. But I, I just sort of think it's weird that everybody refers to him as Sir Mulberry, except for his kind of close-ish friend, Lord Frederick, who's the only one who calls him Hawk, which makes me think, like, would his friend be the one who calls him by his first name and everyone else call him by his surname? But, but, but what? Yeah. Yeah, no, 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 Mr. Hawk, he, he seems like a very formal, now very scarred gentleman who's limping yes. and has a mad eye moody kind of looking yes. eye. Yes, well, there's basically our scar check in. Um, yeah, his scar is healing from his scuff with Nicholas, but yeah, uh, but yeah still there, pretty prominent. So, yeah, so both uh, Mr. Hawk and Lord Frederick have converged on this casino, and you know, based on the events. Of previous episodes, they're not friends anymore, and they're acting very coldly towards each other. Yes. And uh, they have sort of a, a cordial conversation that turns very uncordial when Hawk reveals that he still has his plans for revenge against Nicholas. And, uh, uh, yeah, Lord Frederick is very much against this and sends him some warnings, and the two of them begin to fight in the middle of the casino. But what you expect to turn into a big, big scuffle uh, is basically just, yeah, you think Hawk is going to punch Lord Frederick, but Lord Frederick kind of just shoves him and he falls down and makes a big scene and like, he hit me, everyone, you see that? He hit me, oh my goodness, wow, I, I'm the victim. Um, remember, this is the guy who tried to rape Kate multiple times, so don't, don't nobody feel no, sympathetic towards him. Um, um, yeah, so, you know, so his honor is bruised and they basically are going to have a duel, the two of them, Lord Frederick and Mr. Mulberry Hawk. Yes. So. The classic Victorian pistols at dawn duel, just like we saw in Bridgerton. Mm -hmm. So yeah, duels, duels, this is just how classy men resolve all their problems with deciding that one of us will be dead by dawn. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, so. So, uh, yeah, so we kind of cut ahead, skipping ahead a bit to the duel. Uh, Lord Frederick has been warned by his second that Sir Hawk, Sir Mulberry Hawk, is an excellent shot or a splendid shot. So, uh, but he doesn't seem very concerned. He sort of monologues in the mist for a little bit. And just as the duel's about to start and Hawk is like very confidently cocking his gun, Lord Frederick reveals that he owes Ralph Nickleby 10,000 pounds. And he is not... Yeah, it's a hefty sum. And more importantly, he is not married, which means if he dies, then that debt will die with him. And uh, because uh, Hawk has a lot of business dealings and kind of interconnected money concerns with Ralph, if he dies in this duel then Ralph and all of his investors are completely screwed because they will never see that money. And as he confidently, as Lord Frederick confidently tells Hawks, either way, I'll destroy you, won't I? (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, either he's gonna gonna shoot and kill Hawk, or he's gonna die in the duel and Hawk will be bankrupt. (laughs) So... Pretty, pretty cool plan, Lord Frederick. Hats off to him on this one. Yeah. Like, you know, really sacrificing himself just to send a big F you to all of his enemies, but mm-hmm. who were basically, up until a week ago, his close personal friends, which is, you know, interesting heel turn this character has taken, but, you know, I respect him for it. Yeah. 
Uh, so the duel ensues, uh, and also interesting, the camera work reveals that Kate, or at least the actress playing Kate, is watching from the balcony. I don't think we're supposed to interpret this as Kate herself. It's not Kate. Is it's actually basically just like the the ominous the the ensemble watching, yeah. this, which I have to say. I was not pleased with this staging. I thought I thought this is where they were going to finally use the ramp that goes through the audience that we see in every intro. Yeah. And I was like, if there's if there's ever a spot to use that freaking ramp, it's well, they used it paces come, either way, and they used it two episodes ago when they were take when they were kidnapping Spike, squeers, yeah, or yeah. Spike, yeah, when Squeers yeah. was kidnapping Spike and taking him. That was just like the perfect blocking spot where I'm like, if if, if ever you need to use that rampy thing. That's a spot to use because it's the perfect dueling yeah, spot. Like, where they're like, no. I thought but visually. I, but I, guess, I, I, I guess it says it's the blood they had to get on yeah. Lord Frederick, that they had to hide it better. Yeah, like, I, I, your point taken, and I think that would have been an interesting staging. Visually, I, I was very pleased with the duel. I thought it looked very nice, sort mm-hmm. of just, like, very striking. So, I, yeah, it, it doesn't bother me that much. That Maybe it could have been a little better a different way. Like, I love the fog. Yeah. I love the sort of... Oh, well, the movie. fog was great in this episode. Yeah. The atmosphericness of this episode, fantabulous. And the, and the blocking of the duel was just very well done. So, so to describe the duel... So, yeah, Kate was watching from the balcony, but it's just the actor playing Kate, not necessarily yeah. the character of Kate it being is present. Not Kate. But I thought it was interesting that they not only staged it that way, but deliberately used the camera work to show that, because clearly there's artistic intent behind yes. Her being there, so well done. Um, so they do their ten paces, and Hawk shoots Lord Frederick, and he's still standing. He raises his gun, like, "Yo, I may be shot, but I'm still gonna shoot you." And Hawk is like bracing yeah. himself, but then he kind of just smirks, lowers his pistol, and falls dead. So either way, thus he has destroyed dies Lord Frederick. Yes, thus dies Lord Frederick. Which you know what? For a kind of interestingly ambivalent character through a lot of this like he's not he, he's like kind of a been a, a lot of a foil to hawk as like sure yeah. he's kind of rich scum but look at how much worse he could be and at least he has a conscience and has a change of heart i yeah. i think this this is like a nice cap off to this character i, I like yeah he has his redemption and i like how he kind of very vindictively takes all of his enemies down with him <laughs> like well well done lord frederick well done. Um, so yeah, so Hawk needs to needs to leave, and you know his second tells him we must leave for Brighton and France, not Brighton or France, but Brighton and France. <laughs> so yeah, so you know the law is after you. You got to get out of the country, yeah. and Lord Frederick insists, "Give me one hour. I will meet you at the stagecoach in one hour," because he's got plans, big plans that we'll talk about in a minute. But before he leaves, or just right after he leaves, the two other friends from this little posse of four that we've always seen together, um, they they make quick business of scavenging Lord Frederick's body of valuables because, well, he doesn't need I have that it. moment. It, they're, 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 I, I have that moment. Trust me, we'll get to that moment. Mm-hmm. There is a tie in there. Okay, interesting. <laughs> um, so... We cut over to uh, Nicholas, who is out in the streets brooding about Madeline's situation. And we get this kind of long Greek chorus sequence. Uh, I'm guessing this is all taken verbatim from Dickens, but pontificating on the wealth gap in England and the sort of uh, socioeconomic inequality that is pervading all of the various decisions that characters are making, including us, and especially Madeline in this instance, selling mm-hmm. herself to save a mama because capitalism <laughs> is bad. You know, so it is, it wouldn't be Dickens if we didn't get some kind of monologue about how, you know, capitalism and industrialism and money yeah. is the root of all evil. Cool. Then Noggs shows up and tells Nicholas to never lose hope, but Nicholas isn't having it. Cool. Good scene. <laughs> All right, here we get to the big one, because it is Goblin's wedding to Madeline. Ralph is helping with all the preparations and stuff. This and, scene right here. Yeah, oh, that's yep, that's the one you got right behind you. Yep. Okay, so... Ralph and Nicholas is right there, too. Okay, cool. So, uh, yeah, so the wedding kind of begins, and, you know, the way it's being staged... They're just going through a little too much of the ceremony when it could have been skipped that it's becoming very, very, 
very apparent that we're about to see a graduate happen. <laughs> um, yes. Because as we get into the, you know, uh, dearly beloved, da, 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 all the formalities, if anyone has reason why these two, you just know Nicholas is going to show up pounding on the glass and be like, Madeline, <laughs> Madeline. <laughs> you know, it happened in The Graduate. Yeah. You know, which, what year was The Graduate? Was the 1970? Yeah, so. 72? So even though it, it, that's kind of the thing. Every interrupted wedding scene after The Graduate has always, in its own way, been a riff on The Graduate. And even though yes. Dickens wrote this in the 1830s, the stage show is living in a postgraduate world and we can't. There, is, there, 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 there actually is a play of The Graduate. Yeah. Well, yeah, as, you know, many things. Um, but yeah, just everything from like Wedding Crashers to Wayne's World 2, just like, <laughs> you know, you can't have an interrupted wedding scene postgraduate without those yeah. kind of uh, connotations floating in the air. Yes. Uh, so yeah, so sure enough, you know, in case you didn't see it coming, Nicholas shows up and he's got Kate with him and they object uh, because this wedding can't possibly be proper because it's happening out of extortion. Um, right. So Ralph kind of steps up and he's going to do all the talking. And, you know, Goblin sort of like chimes in and be like, oh, I bet it's just because he wants to marry her, not because he has any legitimate claims of his own. So Nicholas being Nicholas shoves the goblin. <laughs> then Ralph tries to grab Kate, at which point Nicholas shoves Ralph. And, you know, a big fight is clearly going to ensue, but it is interrupted when that one hour is clearly being put to use here because Hawk enters, crashing with ceremony. Still limping and going on mad eye moody on him. Yeah, so Hawk, it, I think it's very interesting, just we'll talk as this goes, but like, you know, it was very important to him that he not go into his exile so he can do what we see in this mm -hmm. scene. So just keep that in mind. So he shows up, crashing the ceremony, and he wants to announce that Fred is dead. Lord Frederick has been killed by me. <laughs> and he tells, you know, Ralph what this means financially. And much to Ralph's chagrin, he very much understands the gravity of the consequences of this. Mm -hmm. And so that this, I, I feel like the, this next part that I'm going to comment on wouldn't have communicated the same way in the theater as it did in the film. But Nicholas sort of like kind of steps up to comment. And then we hear what to me sounds like a splat as he stopped. And we, we kind of then pan out and Hawk still has the pistol and he's pointing it at Nicholas. So just based on the framing of this, I thought for a second he stabbed Nicholas. Just like, oh, no. there was, I, I wound it back and watched it like three times. There is a splat sound effect there. I did not imagine that. <laughs> like a okay. tiny, like I imagine it is just probably the pistol brushing up against probably a like microphone that Roger has on his costume that kind of made yes. like a, I don't think they added it like in post because that wouldn't make sense. But yeah. just like the the sound effect and the and the facial expression that Roger made and like the stop, like I thought for sure it's like a end of pay it forward surprise you're stabbed now like kind of <laughs> surprise <laughs> spoiler, spoiler alert for pay it forward, <laughs> oh. <laughs> but yeah, uh, but no, uh, Hawk still has the gun and he's pointing it at Nicholas and he's like yeah ha, ha, I have my revenge now and. But then he pulls the trigger and gotcha, it's empty. Yeah, 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 yeah. Again, this is why he's prolonging not going into exile, because this is what he really wanted to do. He wanted to threaten Nicholas. Well, yeah, he wanted to tell Ralph something that he's going to find out in like an hour anyway. And he wanted to threaten but not kill Nicholas. For well, don't forget, that's yeah. what Lord Frederick was trying to stop, was, was, was Mulberry Hawk going after Nicholas. Yeah. But, like, he still has his reasons for wanting revenge against Nicholas. This is nothing. He's he's giving Nicholas the win by actually announcing the news that his enemy is destroyed. <laughs> his real enemy, Ralph. Yes. Then, Madeline starts crying. And she says, he's dead. And uh, Hawk is like, yes, he is, and walks away. But she's not talking about Lord Frederick. She's talking about her father, Mr. Bray, who just up and died in the middle of the chair. Well, he knew he was going to die eventually. Yeah, he, he was he's been sick. 
<laughs> but yeah, I guess all of this commotion was too much for him, and he just, boom, dead in the chair. And now she is free to refuse to marry the goblin. <laughs> um, because, you know, he promised to save her family from ruin, save her father, and look at him yes. now. Yes. Again, the debts still exist, and especially yeah. these are debts to Ralph, who certainly needs to claim them now. <laughs> well, I mean, Nicholas has been alluding to a upcoming plot point that will get more elaboration. But there is some money that I, Madeline may be coming into. Yes. So we're getting to that in just a second. Uh, so, yeah, so she, you know, Madeline, now that her father's dead, she's calling off the wedding. And Kate is helping escort her away because Lady Solidarity. And yep. when uh, Ralph objects and says, Kate, you bring her back here right now, you niece of mine. Uh you know, Kate objects, and I wrote down the quote, this was pretty spicy of Kate, and I loved it. Um, I have much more right than you had to allow what happened to me here. So kind of throwing up in his face, you know, the, the horrible treatment she had at his little soiree at the hands of Mr. Hawk. So, you know, you don't get to tell me, you know, this is our fight song kind of deal. Um, yes. So now that... Ralph's money is waste paper, as Nicholas puts it. He no longer has any power, and Nicholas kind of leaves. And uh, the g goblin and Ralph are kind of, like, stuck behind there. And uh, Ralph says, I blame Bray for the wedding falling apart. And when the goblin says, what for? He says, for not living an hour longer. Which is like, that, that was a funny line. I like that. Um, so then he sends Bray... No, not Bray. He sends Goblin home. Yes. Uh, and then Ralph kind of soliloquizes about his losses. It's Javert's big bridge moment. Yes, it it's is. It's not on a bridge. <laughs> it's not on a bridge, but it's that same, you know, doesn't have the same consequences, at least not yet. We'll see what happens in the next episode. But, yes. <laughs> um, and that's not a spoiler. I genuinely don't know. Uh, but then <laughs> his soliloquy is interrupted by Goblin running back. And announcing that Peg, you know, the woman from earlier, his yes. maid and or lover, who knows, she has robbed him and run away with the deed, the mysterious deed. And uh, he's probably going to jail. And because Ralph promised to get him a wife, and now that promise hasn't come into fruition, if he's going to jail, he's taking Ralph down with him. Real heel turn for this character. I kind of love yeah. this Canadian goblin. <laughs> Who, just like a moment ago, was like, oh, it's not your fault, Ralph. Things happen. <laughs> like, so, like, that. that's kind of funny. Uh, you can't trust a goblin, I guess, is the moral. <laughs> okay, so now we're at the home stretch of this episode. Uh, Nicholas is with Smike. This is... 35 and a half minutes into this episode, we're finally seeing Smike for the first time. And considering yeah. we ended the last episode on, like, the cliffhanger, as I called it, of, oh no, Smike is heartbroken that Kate and Frank are getting on, like, thieves. I think that's more in the direction of the play that that came out looking like a cliffhanger, because in the book, there's no real romantic. Well, that's the thing, we're reviewing the play here. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. and, and I do recognize that it was given more weight based on the fact that we ended the episode on there, which in the theater yes. would have. But it was still framed as a big moment with music, with, you know, sad lighting, and mm -hmm. kind of a big sort of story turning point here. So, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I kind of feel like, wow, the fact that we're only seeing Smike <laughs> You know, more more than halfway through, kind of like we're at twenty minutes left in this episode, and we're just seeing Smike now. And Smike, at first, I thought it was just that he's heartbroken, which at least would have been the continuation there. But it turns out Smike has some rare disease, and he is going to die. Which I don't know about you, but to me, this felt like this kind of came out of nowhere. Um, like he's well, I knew it was coming all along. This was the one thing I remembered from my re initial reading of the book back back in the day was Smike's demise. Well, yeah, like I'm not saying Smike shouldn't die or that it's not meaningful for the story. It's just like of all the time we've spent with this character, <laughs> <laughs> maybe this could have been building since Yorkshire that he has been sick this whole time, and then you know when they're with the Crummels, he finally gets 
you know, the kind of spirit to sort of fight it yeah. better. And now being back in the, the heartbreak from Kate is what's, again, they set up all these interesting things, but they don't, everything feels well, disconnected. I think it's because, once again, we have to remember that when this was published, this was an episodic tale. Yeah, so it's something where it's like, if Dickens all of a sudden felt like, oh, I should kill off Spike. Well, again, I think. He shows up in the next episode. But without this, any proper, is, like, long-term plot building of well, Spike's but, demise. And this I think with Fontaine, like, like, Fontaine in the book, if you read her character in the book, her, like, her tuberculosis, which is what also Smike gets in the book. Um, yeah, they don't actually call it tuberculosis or even consumption in the play, which I thought was interesting. It's sort of this mysterious disease that he now has, yes. but we go on. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so yeah, like in the book, like in both books, Fontaine and Smike, they don't get a lot of build up to their demise. It's kind of like, oh, and they die. <laughs> yeah, but we're not there yet, so let's finish the yeah. summary. Um, All right, let's finish. But yeah, so Smike is, Smike is deathly ill and he collapses into a little setup of flower pots. So, and Kate and Frank run in to come help him because those are the two people he wants to see right now. I said Frank. Oh, did you say Frank? I said Kate and Frank. Yeah, Nicholas was there kind of chumming with them. And he's like, help, help. And then Kate and Frank. And so Mike is probably like, great, these two are the last people I want to see, (laughs) you know. Um, But yeah, they come in and save them, kind of, or sort of like bring him to safety, uh, lift him back up, and the chorus sort of monologues about this dread disease and then we kind of get this sort of surrealist dreamy sequence of smike and was his name mr brooker the beggar the clerk yeah, from Ralph's yeah, past? yeah 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 the mysterious man yes. yeah so mr brooker shows up to smike and he says i know you and like so they recognize each other smike's like i know you and like oh what's going on here but then oh no it was just a dream <laughs> And Smike wakes up, and uh, it turns out that now Nicholas and Kate are going to take Smike away to their childhood home in Devon, and then in we the get country. in the country, yeah, and they get this sort of sad act changey Smike motif song yes. <laughs> playing, um, and then because like why linger on the emotional stuff for very long? Who do we cut back to? The Kenways. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so when we last left the Kenwigs, I skipped this on the recap of the previous episode, but they, you know, Mr. Kenwig flew off the handle when he found out that Mr. Lily they got married, which means that they're gonna, if not completely lose their inheritance, at least have it radically diminished. So, yeah, so the Kenwigs are visited by Mr. Lilyvick, and they're basically giving him the cold shoulder about how dare you be so cruel by getting married. Um, <laughs> again, from Mr. Lilyvick's perspective, this should make no sense at all, but he's very, feels put yeah. in his place, and he's like, you're right, I was very cruel. And then, but he's also kind of at his lowest, because after they chew him out for like 15,000 hours, <laughs> yeah, at least that's what it felt like <laughs> the whole thing was by like three minutes tops. <laughs> Again. Can you tell Ryan hates Mr. Lilybeck and the, Ke- the Keswick family? I, I don't even hate them as characters. I hate them as a symbol of bad adaptation here. Because unless the final episode reveals some very big important thing about them, which I can't imagine it will, but we'll get to that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so Mr. Lilybeck, kind of after sort of just taking all this chewing out in stride, he announces that his wife has left him. She's eloped with a captain. And, you know, he's very sad. And now the Kenwigs are like, oh, we're so happy that your wife left. Come here, Mr. Lilybeck. We love you. Please put us back in the will. <laughs> um, so what I will just say, and that's basically the whole scene. <laughs> but what I will say about it is this is the first time that we've had a scene with these characters that Nicholas was not in. And I don't know if I should get into this now or wait till we're kind of doing the appraisal of the episode, but at least all the previous scenes, which I also think were redundant, they've all at least been how these characters and their sort of, let's call it a D plot at this point, because it's so far from <laughs> <laughs> but these characters in their depot have always been kind of like intersecting with Nicholas's story, and he's Nicholas has been the sort of POV character that we are experiencing this little slice of their life through. 
Mm-hmm. This is the first time we've had a scene with these characters without Nicholas altogether. That is just, oh, right, we need to resolve the Kenwig Lilyvick subplot. So, yeah. yeah, this is what happened. This is what's happening with them. And the fact that it's not even intersecting with Nicholas' story anymore, it's just resolving it for its own sake because we bothered to introduce them at all. I felt like, again, I hope this is the last we see of them, but I also hope that. Do you want, do you want, do you want me to spoil it for don't you? Don't spoil. We have one episode left. Okay. <laughs> um, again, part of me is like, I really just don't want to see these people anymore. I'm so sick of them. We have spent a whole short plays worth of time with him in this very long play <laughs> like, like you if you would just extract all the stuff with these characters you have like an hour-long fringe play all to yourself like it's true <laughs> and like we don't need that in this already very long story that they are so on the periphery of yes <laughs> um so yeah so on one hand i'd be very happy if they just don't show up at all in the final episode but i'd also be that would make me even more pissed that this really has been all for nothing because i am I'm imagining this is what you would have spoiled just now, but refrain from doing so. I imagine they will have an appearance in the final episode because, and maybe, maybe, maybe that will have made all of this worth it, or at least made some of it worth it. I'd be very surprised if it makes all of it worth it. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. Anyway, Smike is dying. Remember that? Oh, you forgot yeah. because we had a Kenwick subplot? Cool. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so Smike is dying. But first we have to check in on Ralph and Squeers. Uh, so they're having a conversation uh, in which, you know, Squeers is getting very worried that Snall- that people are going to find out that Snolly was lying about being Spike's actual father. Mm-hmm. And to the audience, so big reveal, that was a lie. <laughs> um, because, yeah, we're, the way it was framed in the previous scene that this was mentioned, it wasn't necessarily a lie. But no, we we got we got Squeers being like, oh man, I think the jig might be up. Mm-hmm. Um, but Ralph, and he also like, gets recruited. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, then, where the scene is going is, uh, they need to get the deed that the goblin lost or that Peg stole from the goblin. So Ralph is like, okay, Squeers, I will pay you fifty, nay, a hundred pounds if you retrieve this deed to me. Um, and that, uh, yeah. So that's that whole scene. Then, hey, remember, Smike is dying still. Um, so we check in with Nicholas and Kate, and they brought Smike to their childhood home, and they're giving him a tour of, like, that's where Kate used to sleep. This is a tree. And there's this special tree that uh, when Kate was lost as a child, she laid out underneath, and then when their father found her, he said, I want to be buried by this tree where my daughter is lay down for safety when she was a child so that's Mm -hmm. so their father's grave is right at this tree and smike makes nicholas promise that when he dies he'd be buried by that same tree because he's part of the nickleby family and he wants to he also wants to have his resting place be the place that kate chose as a child (laughs) um So Smike is, you know, still dying, and we get this kind of, like, sibling conversation between Kate and Nicholas, and Nicholas is all like, oh, I know my bestest friend of the whole wide world is dying, but I'm so sad about Madeline. Um, (laughs) You know, priorities. And uh, Kate confesses to him that, well, I too am in love with Frank Cherubble. And like, oh my goodness, I had no idea. Has he proposed? And like, yes, he did propose off stage. That might have been interesting to see. But I had to turn him down. And like, oh no, why did you turn him down? Well, because the Cherubles have been so nice to you and they and they have money and I wouldn't want anyone to think that I'm only marrying him for that or that there's anything kind of fishy and extortative about the relationship between our two families. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so the two siblings basically just vow to be lonely together for the rest of their lives. You, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, there's some weird siblingy dynamic between them mm-hmm. that we don't need to unpack, but it's no. there. Um, <laughs> you know, they both have people they love that they could just be happy with, who are not attached at the moment, and like whatever. But no, they're just going to be lonely together because it's a Dickens story, I guess. Um, yes. So Smike wakes up, and he doesn't seem well, but wait, he does the apothecary scene from R&J, 
and Nicholas does the Romeo lines, and together they do this scene, to, and it's very sad and impactful. And those actors were given it. I have to say, like the fact we got to see the close-ups, mm-hmm. all three of them were like literally pouring out tears there. Yeah, like, that it, 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 acting it was, wise, they were killing it. Yeah, pretty raw scene, like I must say. Yeah. And yeah, so they're doing it. Uh, they're doing the R and J scene, and then Smike dies in Nicholas's arms. Thus ends the episode. <laughs> All right, yeah. So that's the summary. Jeez. <laughs> so a lot happens yeah. in this episode. Um, it does. What's well, it? An ultimate. Things got to start wrapping well, up. And that's the thing. So I will kind of begin the sort of commentary section on. Uh, the last episode had me very worried about where this was going. Like the last, the previous episode, episode seven. Like, yeah. so while this episode, I think, was kind of a mess in its own way, not as messy as the previous one, we're at least tying up loose ends or starting to kind of pull the threads yeah. together. Yeah. Whereas the previous episode is just like, let's singe the ends of the interesting threads so we can start all new threads. Yeah. <laughs> like, and I was not there for that, but at least this episode, okay, we got like our resolution, maybe. There might be more with them in the next episode, but of the mm-hmm. of the Lord Frederick, Mr. Hawk, kind of that seems yeah. to be. If we do not see them, well, we're obviously not going to see Lord Frederick again because he's dead, but if we don't see Mr. Hawk again in the next episode, I will still feel like his story is complete. Like, um, you know, you're smirking, we'll see where this is going, but... <laughs> But the fact that, like, you know, there's actually, you know, we've kind of gotten this sort of near fatal blow on Ralph that is motivating his uh-huh. decisions for we got to find the deed. We got to like, you know, we are propelling towards a conclusion here, which I think yes. is like good. Smike's death is obviously the big sort of culmination of this episode. And I think, yeah, that is a, a kind of <laughs> sorry, this is probably a silly comparison to make, but why not? Uh you know how the second last episode of every Game of Thrones season is the big event episode and then the final yes. episode is the long denouement? Yes. I feel like Smike's death is the death of Ned Stark. Spoilers for Game of Thrones. Um, I can see that. Like, or yeah, it is like Game of Thrones kind of went off the rails with this as the seasons went on where <laughs> they decided that big event was synonymous with big battle and so every sec- second last episode had to always be a big battle as opposed to it's just no, the bastards, something the bells, yeah like well I, and I think Black, Blackwater <laughs> which was the penultimate episode of season two yeah. is probably one of my favorite episodes of Game of Thrones it's a great ever. episode but, but they took the wrong lesson from that is, yep, every season, second last episode has to be a battle as opposed to something yeah. big has to happen. Is that when you have this sort of like episodic, multi-part serialized storytelling, you know, don't rush the climax, let the climax happen at the end and then mm-hmm. spend your whole last episode sort of dealing with the ramifications of it. And I think that's what the death of Smike kind of yeah. does here. My concern and we'll see how this plays out in the final episode, is I don't know what the stakes still are with Smike's story specifically. Because to me, what has always been the kind of source of tension around Smike, especially in these last few episodes, is, oh no, they're going to kidnap him and take him back to Yorkshire, and he's going to live a miserable life. (laughs) And while certainly his death is sad, it kind of saves him from that possibility that we've been concerned about this whole time. That he sort of, it's not necessarily on his own terms, but he died with the Nicklebees living the life that he kind of wanted to, not the life it's that... It's a happy ending. Yeah, like it's not, you know, obviously it's not his own terms because the disease sort of comes out of nowhere and takes him off guard. But yeah, he he didn't get taken back to Yorkshire. He's not being punished by Mr. Squeers. He's with two of his favorite people in the whole wide world. Like, he's... Yeah. It, and yeah, so I, I... I'm happy that, you know, he didn't have, like, a sad or kind of end in, in yes. that way. Like, certainly it's sad for different reasons. But I wonder especially because of a certain spoiler that I do still know is coming that I will not <laughs> say aloud to, for anyone who's watching in real time. Yeah. I wonder what, when that's, when that big reveal happens, I don't think it 
I can't imagine why it would even matter at this point. Right. Like, or it wouldn't matter as much as it would have if Smike were still alive, I guess. <laughs> um, well, I mean... No spoilers, it, just before it, you it, formulate it, this thought. It uh. will play a part. There, it, 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 it does play a part in, in the final episode. All that right. Smike is no longer around. Okay. So, yeah, but, yeah, while there's this kind of, like, bittersweet, sure, he's dead, but he's not, you know, he's safe now, in a way. Um, the kind of curly Gates end of a melodrama kind of uh, thing happening here. Um, yeah. Yeah, like, I, I have mixed feelings about it, but it it's, I, I am happy that the ends are getting tied a bit. And I also, something that I think is interesting about this episode is you know, based on the let's be lonely together sibling conversation that ended there, I do think that this episode is doing a good job, speaking of tying loose ends, of systematically eliminating all of Kate's suitors. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, well, that Frank will, I think, be the last man standing, because there was a while there when Frederick was starting to have his change of heart and turning against mm -hmm. Hawk that I thought, okay, maybe... You know, he's because he's changing his ways and he's becoming a nice guy and he's not with Hawk anymore. He will marry Kate and that will solve the Nickelbees' yes. financial issues. Um, but no, Lord Frederick is dead. Obviously, Mr. Hawk was never an actual suitor because he's a predator. Yeah. But yeah, he's out of the picture, too. And Smike, who, you know, that would have been sort of the sweetest person for Kate mm -hmm. to wind up with because, you know, we love and care about him. <laughs> Smike is dead, yeah, yeah. so kind of of all the various men who have been in contention for Kate's hand, Frank is the last man standing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let's see how that pays off, if at all. But right, interesting right. Kind of sort of tying up loose ends there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm trying to think. I I'll be curious, sort of. So I guess now that Smike, the, the Smike plot more or less feels like it's resolved and anything else that might come up about it is really just you know, it's after the fact. Mm -hmm. Oh, this might have meant something in, but probably won't mean as much as it could have, like I'm suggesting. Yeah. What what are we left with going into this final episode? Will Nicholas well, and maybe it's, live yeah. happily ever after? Will yeah, Squeers find the deed before Nicholas does? Yeah. Like, <laughs> sorry, sorry, what you were saying? No, no, like I was saying, like, basically now we're basically narrowing the storylines down, right? It's, it's yeah. kind of like what Game of Thrones did at the end, where it very quickly became clear it's mainly between da Daenerys and Jon. Yeah. The, the main two plots. I mean, Cersei should have been the third person there, but they kind of... Well, but yeah. Up ...at the end. Um, so... And I, I, mean, I feel like, yeah. obviously, we're dealing with a very different time scale versus eight seasons of Game of Thrones and yes. one season of Nicholas Nickleby, let's call it. Yeah. Uh, so I feel like less so is this the, you know, we've arrived at the final episode of Game of Thrones and it's just Daenerys and Jon resolving their thing as much as it is we're going into the final season of Game of Thrones and Daenerys' yeah. ships are arriving in Westeros. Like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, let's see how that kind of, or, you know... Uh, but yeah, the, the plots are narrowing. I definitely see mm -hmm. this. The, you know, will Nicholas and friends find the deed before Squeers and Ralph do is probably going to be the big sort of yeah. last conflict, I imagine. You know, the last conflict is Ralph and Nicholas. Is, is Ralph and Nicholas? That's the big final. And that's fair. That's where we start. That has to be resolved. And yeah. you know, that has been the kind of you know, for this very episodic story that really hasn't felt like it's had a lot of through line through it. Like, yes, I, I am all... Well, it's because Nicholas keeps going away. <laughs> yeah. Like, he's never around long enough with Ralph to really build up the tension. They're See, always kind of off doing their own thing. See, and cross paths and then... See, <laughs> Ralph isn't Cersei. Ralph is the White Walkers, I think. Hmm. <laughs> he is this kind of big existential threat that has been looming over Nicholas's yeah. happiness, I guess, kind of, this whole time. I, I'm I'm optimistic going into this next episode of where this is heading, um, but cautious optimism because uh, I haven't always been satisfied with how things are paid off. <laughs> um, I yeah, I was gonna just complain about the Kenwigs and Lily Vicks more, but like we don't need to do that. Don't we don't need to do that. I, I just in terms of on the topic of payoffs, like, well, do you uh, want to? 
can get into the adaptation then and, and, sure. and kind of give you some surprises. So, uh, this once again, there's a lot that is correct. Like this falls much more linearly in the, in the books. This stuff got flipped around a little bit, like like the like where we left off last time. The next thing that would have happened would have been the duel. However, we got more Mister Gride and Peg getting that all set up. Uh, so, but the big thing is, is that Mulberry Hawk does not stick around. He flees right away, so he's not in the wedding scene in the book. Oh, so that was entirely an addition for the play. Yes. Okay, that's interesting. I no, 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 much. There could be a scene later on in the book that I just haven't gotten to yet. Well, has the wedding but... happened already? Yes. In the book? Yeah. No, so no, then no. I can't imagine that. Like, well, I think that's interesting because I sort of, I kind of jokingly opined that like. That was a silly reason for him to decide to, to decide to stick around for an hour to pull a prank on Nicholas, not actually seek it out as revenge, but pull a prank and to inform Ralph of news that he's going to find out about, like within the next day anyway. <laughs> like, so, like, yeah, I, I kind of thought that was a silly reason for him to put off, you know, fleeing. But I just assumed that was in the book. But so that's interesting no. that you mentioned that that was invented for the adaptation. Yeah, no, he's not. In, he's not in the wedding scene. But Nicholas does get all fisty cuffs in the wedding, as he would. Like, I but wouldn't mind have you, it any but, 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 but mind you, it's more explained in the book. Like, for example, Mister Gride is blocking the door, preventing them from exiting, which is why Nicholas starts the fight because he's like, "Just get out of my freaking way. We're leaving. Ray is dead," and Bride's like, "No." <laughs> and then Nicholas is like, get out of my way, old man. And kind of shunts him out of the way. And Ralph gets in there too. And there's a bit more of a scuffle. Yeah. But the big thing is also that Madeline does go and start living with Nicholas okay. and Kate. Interesting. Um, See, and, I feel like that's and, alluded to here because like she leaves with them, but we don't see her again in this episode after that. Well, moment. she's off living with, in recovering from mental and physical like strain of of, of the whole father situation, <laughs> and is recovering, and her mu- and, and Mama Nickleby is not overly pleased with with Madeline and, and Nicholas's infatuation. She keeps calling her dull and boring. Oh my god! <laughs> like she, at least as we see her, this she kind of is, but like yeah. that's a nice way to kind of get chummy with your recently traumatized, probably future daughter-in-law. Like, <laughs> yeah. So there's that. I mean the. the uh, the charitable so like in the book we get an explanation of why they're not around more to help Nicholas and all this. Turns out for the better part of the first third of all these chapters, they are away out of the country. Which okay. is why which is why Nicholas can't go to them for help with the debts and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh but then they get back and they're like, Good job, old chum, you know, <laughs> save the day. And then and see that I would like to see. I'll I'll never say no to another charitable scene. Honestly, like, well, don't worry. Well, don't worry. There's more of them coming up. Um, okay. Now, now that we're back in the country. Uh, also in the chapter where Kate uh, and Madeline are all kind of chumming around together, we do get a little bit more of the Frank and Kate relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't. We, we 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 don't get to see the proposal. But we do get to see the the fact that they are falling for each other. There's a bit more of that build up. Yeah, which I feel like we got enough of that in the cliffhanger of the previous episode that we probably, I I think I will agree that that's a fine thing to cut since I kind of thought it did feel sudden to jump from that and then two hours later you know, we get the whole, oh, he's already proposed. Like, oh, okay. (laughs) Yes. Uh, So there's that. Um, there is a scene with Mr. Square that I have a feeling has got to move to the next episode. Okay. Uh, they get that because I, I guess they were setting that scene up uh, in this episode, but that there is a chapter dedicated to what happens there, and it also involves other characters too that you will get to see. Um, but yes, there's a little bit more of that <clears throat> storyline with, with the with the deed and and Squeers, so. Stay tuned for that. I thought that was coming in this episode because that's where it would have fallen in the book. But no. Okay. Um, the, 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 the Lily Vex, we do get them. They do get their chapter and their resolution. Um, and then and then uh, uh, Smite does die in the book. Well, I, I would have been very uh, surprised if they made that up for the play, that Smite dies. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, Stephen Schwartz <laughs> doesn't kill off Alphaba, even though in the book she burns to death. They well, decide like, to do the whole she lives routine at the end of Wicked. Yeah. And very clear in the book, she is literally burned at the stake. 
Yeah, but also, like, her death is in the original source material. They're not just the novel <laughs> Wicked, but, like... Yeah, I know, but it's it the fact that Stephen Schwartz just made the choice of, nope, she's gonna live. I like, not I think, caring what, what was in the book. Yeah, and I think they're fine. That is, like, part of annotational license to kind of... Uh, to that, do... No, I gotta... My, my whole thing is, if a character dies in the source material, there is a reason. Kill them off. Don't... I, don't... I, bring, like... I'm not don't necessarily saying that. Wicked is the is the case test for why I would disagree with that, but I, I do think there are reasons to play with that in context, in some context, case by case basis. I don't I don't want to be like unilateral about that. I think there has to be a really good explanation of of particularly if a character is supposed to die and they don't die, what's the reason? Like that's I think, my so in the case of Wicked, I would say it would just be a bummer ending. Like in this kind no, of no, it's supposed it's a truthful ending of what happens, and it drives more the story. Well, it's a bummer ending in what is otherwise a pretty empowering story. So, like, yeah, I I, I don't blame Stephen. We got Glinda to, 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 to you know, we got Glinda to be the empowering ending of the story. Either way, that w- 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 Wicked is another story for another day. Um, but yes, yeah, Smite does get his death, so that's kind of where we left off in the book. There's been a little bit of of chopping there and the big thing was Mulberry Hawk is not at the wedding and there is a bigger scene with Squeers coming up in the next episode I hope I hope right. so we'll see how that pays off in this final episode yes. do yes. we want to go through our check-ins this should be our last Smike check-in because hey Smike yes. is gone <laughs> yes. well once again I, I tie it back to the same thing I said in the last episode where because of the way the actor is choosing to portray Smike his dialogue becomes very hard to understand and then because of that, you're having to put on subtitles, and it's like, if, if you're trying to be emotionally empowering, I should at least be able to yeah, follow like follow the dialogue, because this is supposed to be your big, empowering come-to-me moment. So I will say, Smike, Wall, yeah, all the same things we've said in every other episode still stand. Yeah. The fact that he is in addition to being some kind of neurodivergent as he always has been but he's also sick and dying in this one adds that extra layer to the performance Mm -hmm. and i think like you know we've been very hard on this actor this whole time but like i do think he did a good job of layering those things that you can tell that that this is the way he's behaving right now is not just because of how he's always been, but it's because now he's also sick and so close to the end and fighting, but doesn't have it in him to keep going. Like, and I think the whole, I, the whole apothecary scene in this episode that really did feel like, you know, that's the kind of Oscar moment for yes. this actor. Like, <laughs> even though, yeah, he probably shouldn't have been acting the way he did the whole time. Like, yeah. it's very good. Something that, just while we're on the subject of that scene, mm-hmm. um, again, talking about where the, where we could have cut corners in this very long adaptation. Yeah. It struck me that, as I was watching it, that this is the first and only time that since Nicholas and Smike's departure from the Crummels, that the theater subplot has even been mentioned once. (laughs) Which makes me think, while I understand that that's a very iconic part of the Nicholas Nickleby story, you could have cut all of that, and it's actually not contributing anything to, like... uh, Except for Smike's death monologue. But, like, you could have come up with something probably equally impactful to replace it if you were to cut. I'm not saying you should cut the whole Could have been Nicholas into... teaching Smike. Uh, I could have been teaching. Like, that's the passage that Nicholas chose to teach Smike on. on yeah, like, own. they were just reading a book together and they were, like, doing the lines, yeah. like, with each other and then Smike remembered yeah. it. Oh, like, I, I'm not saying you should cut the crumbles and all that, but, like, we spent so much time with them. And it wasn't yes. until seeing this little, little Smike's death scene that I remembered, wow. Nobody has mentioned any of that since, <laughs> since like the since they left, and like it's kind of like, why is that here? <laughs> like, it's I, I I don't know. Like it's I don't have any big. I think you need the crumbles. I think you do need them, just because once again, it's kind of like the escape within the story of this is the one place where Nicholas and um. And uh, and Smike have that false purveyor of yeah, it's uh, the of, of of hope, and in fact that that's where part one ends with them being at the height of their joy with 
Yeah. Um, with the crumbles, like, it's like you need to give them some win. Because if not, they're just wandering the lonely streets. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> depressed. To, to me, it's the... I, I don't recall if I used this term before in a previous episode or if I just thought it to myself, but it's the Timon and Pumbaa's oasis. It's yes. the, you know, we finally found a place where we can be happy, but there's still problems yeah. back home that we're not yes. dealing with. And yes. that... You know, if you actually time that segment of The Lion King, it's pretty short, all things considered. Yeah. Like, they, it, a lot of years it's really transpire. It's the second the movie. Yeah, a, a, year, a lot of years transpire while they're walking across that log, and then Lion King went yes. and have kind of fleshes out what was going on during that time. It's such a great scene. But overall, like, it's not a long segment of The Lion King yeah. itself, but we spent a lot of time in the Crumble subplot, subplot in this play, yeah. and I imagine both in the book as well. <laughs> so Yes. Yes, I think yes, there is fact that could have been trimmed there, there, if not excising that entire subplot. <laughs> True. I mean, I mean, I mean, if it comes down to an adaptation of either the Lily Vix or or the Crumbles, I would rather keep the Crumbles. It's like I Lily find Vicks. the Crumbles more interesting, just because they're fun characters, and I never enjoyed the Lily Vix, like <laughs> or the Kenwigs, like. But yeah, like I, I honestly, I think this could have been. Too there is a way to do a two-hour Nicholas Nickleby stage production. Oh, absolutely. And, absolutely. and I am not sold on why this needed to be nine hours. Not that I'm against a nine-hour play, but I think you really need to earn those nine hours. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. It's true. So, yeah, so, so, yeah, but I mean, adaptation-wise, this was a very solid adaptation. Smike, like, once again, very sad that the character dies. I think the actor overall even though we we really, as you said, we harsh on him every episode. Like, it was a choice. He stuck. I, I commend him for sticking with the choice. Oh, yeah, it would have been really weird if he stopped yeah. doing it after a certain point, because that's like, hey, my autism is cured. Or like, yes. <laughs> like, that's not how any, like, I'm not saying he's specifically autistic or on the spectrum, but like, yeah. that would, that would be, that yeah. would be a weird, bad decision. Like, and I think, yes. A part of, like, I don't remember the impetus when we started doing these check-ins all the way back in episode one, but was it was it with the idea that maybe it would change over time, or that as he spends more time you with Nicholas... Originally thought that it, you, you originally felt that maybe Smike would have some of his um, uh, problems in it disintegrate as he spent more yeah. time with Nicholas. He would well, become more human than... Be, well, or not yeah. even human, but a little, but a little bit more... More... Uh, together in a way yes yeah, yeah I, I don't know how else to describe it but less yeah. like he is well it, it was more just a matter of is this actually some kind of neuroatypicality mm -hmm. or is this just the result of layers of beatings. layers of trauma and like yeah. and beatings and nicholas is gonna yeah nicholas is gonna re re remove yeah, those. the power of friendship will cure him yeah. <laughs> yes <laughs> um, which, which wasn't I, the case I, I don't think either one of those would have been great like yeah. we know now in 2021 that they probably yeah. should have just not had the actor do it this way yeah. Start. Yeah. Tis what it tis. Just go with the Jamie Bell route. Like I, I, I keep going back to Jamie, Jamie Bell because he had the right balance of, of, of Smike. Mind you, I, I think it was a little bit too buff for Smike. Uh, I, uh, but I mean, I, I think his characterization of that character is, is mit, it's a bit more on the line of what we would do today if we were a, a directing this piece. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move on to your late Miz check-in. <laughs> yes, true. Yeah, so the Les Mis check-in. So there were a few Les mis things in here, let me tell you. Uh, first off, the Greek chorus, Nicholas wandering the streets with the <laughs> haze and kind of the weird golden light coming through of the sunrise. I was like, that is straight at the like opening of At the End of the Day. Like, If you watch the original production, not the new one, but the original version that was staged after Valjean rips his parole and runs off stage to do a, a, a quick costume change. All the people come out in their beggar clothes on the turntable and it's literally the same lighting and the same haze and the same costumes. Like with the fact that he had the whole shawl wrap routine. I, 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 I'll have to show you a clip where I just... Yeah, I, just I feel how... like I've seen that. Like I can visualize what you're describing. Yeah. yeah, so basically, yeah, that's basically just a plucked one from the other routine and the fact that once again they're talking about class difference and the first song that, that this song is with is at the end of the day where they're talking all about class difference yeah. i was like i was like wow uh uh, uh um uh karen and uh, 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 karen and nun like they like you just put that sucker right out 
Uh, then we had the whole robbing of the dead body, which was very Tenardier in the sewers. Yeah. The fact that also it was in the haze with the lights as well, which if you watch the original, or not even the original, if you watch Les Mis, that's how that scene is staged too. Yeah. With a lot of haze and just Tenardier picking the ring off the dead body. And so I was like, oh, there's another Les Mis moment. And as we said, the Javert soliloquy moment as Ralph sits in the chair. Yeah. Even though, like, if they, does... I, I was surprised it didn't stage it on the bridge. Well, was like, it... The reason to stage it on the bridge is because he's going to jump and we still have yes. more Ralph to get to here. <laughs> like, There's no reason why this has to, you know, fundamentally well, be I mean, on a bridge. I, well, like, well, well, I mean, I, I, mean I, I guess you could just because if you want to get Ralph out of that chair and out of the wedding scene, show him like, kind of like he's just out on the street. Yeah. Talking to himself. You could have done it that way. But I guess because he was just sitting in the room. Yeah. Like, for the sake of like... Um, the, not even thematic, but just kind of dramatic cohesiveness. Yes. It flowed well that, like, yeah. the the scuffle with Hawk and the wedding kind of yeah. all came and went. Ralph has a moment alone before Goblin comes back to get right. the news. Like, that felt like the right moment for that. And if he yes. had left to wander the streets, walk on a bridge, that would have kind of turned it into a whole separate scene. Yes, very true. Very true. So, yeah, there's that. And then also, you get. Smike's death, which is like it's basically Fontaine's death. It's, yeah. Where you, have, where, where you have Valjean and Fontaine, Valjean cradling Fontaine in the bed as she's dying. Which makes of, me a uh, uh, TB as well. Which makes me really sad that it wasn't immediately followed with Ralph coming in like Nicholas. At last, at last, we meet each other, plain <laughs> Uncle Javert. <laughs> Before you say God, that, would have been great. <laughs> <laughs> that would be so good, but yeah, like that's the big thing there is watching the death, and I was like, Yeah, definitely got the Fontaine vibes here of of, uh, of the final gasps of breath here, and the fact that it, in the book it is identified as TB tuberculosis or yeah. consumption, as they call it. Like, that is the same thing. In the fact yeah, that, this is yes. very Victorian to call tuberculosis consumption. I don't know yeah. why, but, like, that is just a thing if you read enough Victorian novels. It's yeah. a, you will come across many people dying of consumption. Well, well so it was a big plague at the time that, yeah. that it was a thing. And the fact that they didn't know it was transmitted through, like, bodily connection. Like, it wasn't just in the air. Like, you had to kind of kiss someone and pass it along. That's how fun she gets in the book is. So running for like kissing. I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. But yeah, I believe that's how TV is is is, is passed. It's not just in the air. It's yeah. I am something not an epidemiologist, so I'll take your word for it. All right, we'll go for that. But yeah, there we go. So yeah, there's the classic Fontaine death through Spike, and and Nicholas gets to play at his Valjean moment. There okay. too, and the fact that we also get the ghost character showing up at the beginning there too, mm-hmm. of of Mister Bre- What's his name? Um, Brooker, I think. Brooker, yeah, Brooker, yeah, Brooker. The fact that Brooker shows up there, but she potentially has a vision to Smike. Um, so it's the fact that once again we have that, and same thing like Ghost Cosette coming to visit Fontaine in her deathbed. So yeah, there's a lot of things there, um, and the fact that Nicholas has to do the carry off of Smike the same way that Valjean carries off Fontaine when he saves her from prostitution at the end of the prostitution sequence at the docks. So yeah. there's a lot of good things there, but. Yeah, yeah, more lame Izzy stuff. We'll see how it all. We'll see if we get <laughs> stuff at the end. Maybe we'll get a lame Izzy wedding where yeah. Squeers gets to show up and try and extort Nickel Nicholas for some money. Yeah, or we'll end the whole thing on like uh, they barricade and they all just get shot. Well, dead I mean that's by... the other thing there is, <laughs> is, is Lord Frederick's death is once again very uh, on drop the barricade the fall off the top, you'd find him laying laying out on the floor. Like, maybe something. in the staging Dramatic. a little bit, certainly yeah. not plot-wise, they serve very different functions. But... Yes, yes <laughs> um, they do. But it's the fact that, once again, you have the shot in this the very dramatic, slow death of a character who's been shot. <laughs> so that's very much, they took that and just added a whole bunch more people in, the, in a barricade. Yeah, but like, the, the concept of the way they depict death is very similar. <laughs> um, in the book, they do give a beautiful description of Lord Frederick as he's dying and acknowledge the fact that he's been shot by his once friend. Yes. And, he, and he, him realizing that. There's a beautiful passage in there that... Speaking is, of his once friend, we don't need to dwell on this one, but Scar check-in. <laughs> Nicholas still has it. It's very faint now. It's, yeah. Mulberry Hawk has the worst one that's like Mad-Eye mooding up his eye. Yeah. So he's like kind of 
blinded one. It's the fact he's able to still shoot pretty well and get Lord Frederick. I'm impressed. Yeah. Well, they talk about how he's a splendid shot. And like I imagine, we're probably reading too much into this, but he's not blinded in that eye. He's just kind of visually disfigured and scarred. Yeah. Like, because, yeah, I don't think someone with only one eye has the depth perception to <laughs> shoot yeah. someone cold at 10 paces. Like, <laughs> Yes, yeah, very true. Very true. So there's that. Um, but yeah, I think that's kind of it for the Les Mis check-in. So I think that just leaves us with individually episodic. Where does it rank in? How does it work? I wrote it down on my phone this time. Okay, I I wrote mine down too. Good. Well, for me, since I started writing it down a few episodes, it's easy for me to just slot in where will I put this one in relation to the others. So what do you got for me? Where do you put it? Well, you go first. You go first. I I want to hear what you've ranked. So as I said, I think this one is still a bit of a mess. Mm-hmm. But I am happy where with where a lot of things going. It's certainly a very high drama episode. We have yeah. big moments, you know, the wedding, the duel, the Spike's death, like so yeah. it earned some goodwill for me from there. I currently have it set third to last. Okay. Like not because there isn't a lot of good stuff in this episode, just because it's still sort of clumsy and I'm not sure where it's all going still. So my ranking right. is still two three six five one eight that's this episode four seven so third to last immediately following episode one which i still think was like a strong introduction to the piece even if it was kind of lackluster in its own right and episodes four and seven are episode seven is still kind of the only one that i think was outright bad and four with its big sort of um yeah one day more moment i still thought was kind of like a weak episode so right third to last is what i would say for okay this one. okay How all right you? Well, so so mine is um so it goes let's see oh there we are sorry I'm going to work in my notes so it goes two mm-hmm. then six then one then five then eight then seven then three i think did you skip four Oh, sorry, yes, four should be in the juice. Four, four would come after eight. So but I did like the tension in this episode. So eight is kind of oh. like right in the middle for you. Like Yeah. 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 It had enough tension. The action was good. I felt, even though like I don't think this is a standalone episode, that you definitely need the, the backstories to kind of get the payoff well, of Yeah. It is the penultimate episode, so you kinda of need to see all the others to get the full payoff. But the fact that we had some good music, we had Smike's death, the duo, the big dramatic wedding scene. Yeah. Overall, I thought it was a pretty solid episode. So I, I, I agree. It. I was kind of back and forth between if this was going to be third to last or fourth to last, in which case it would have been very much in the middle spot with you. Yeah. I still think epi- I enjoyed episode one more than I enjoyed this one. Just because well, episode I, one is still my third choice. It's still okay. okay. I still really enjoy yeah, it. Yeah, like for me, episode one is in the in the lower middle, mm-hmm. but like because it's. You know, not a lot of drama happens in that episode, but it is yeah. like a good entry into the, the world of the play yes. and sets up a lot of great stuff. Um, yeah. So it was kind of between one and eight for this sort of slot. Those two yeah. can maybe tied for yeah. fourth and third to last, but I think I still put one just a little above this one. Something yeah. I will just say based on a comment you made just a moment ago is when I say that, how does this work as a standalone? That's not me. I don't buy that, and I probably should have clarified this from the very beginning for as long as we've been talking about this, but that's not me saying, can you just watch this and understand what's mm-hmm. happening if you haven't seen the rest? That's obviously not the point, and that's yeah. not the point of any kind of serialized novel or television mm-hmm. series. Like, what I mean by a standalone is more, does this episode kind of have its own beginning, middle, and end coherent right. logic that it's not just a piece of the whole, but yeah. since we are watching this one episode per week do you feel like you've had a reasonable aesthetic experience just with this episode? I think it's had a really good end. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, I guess overall, yeah, we had a nice beginning, middle, end of the episode with like opening with Mr. Gride and Peg, and then we um, get the middle, the highlight of the middle, which is the wedding, and then you get the end with Smike. Um, So yeah, I do think that, oh, that's the one thing I was going to, that's the one other thing I was going to say is I wanted to give a quick shout out uh, to what's her name here? Hold on, I've written it down in my notes. Uh, it is where is she? Where is she? Suzanne uh, Burdish, who who now seen play Fanny Squeers, 
Mrs. Uh, uh, Miss Nevalici, and now she's also played Peg, the blind. Yeah, but like Peg is barely in this. Like I said, she's like maybe. Well, she, well once not. again, knowing in the book, she will have a bit more to do. Okay. So the fact, but the fact that like I didn't even recognize her as the character. Well, that's the thing. She is a chameleon. Like I, I definitely yeah. think as one of the MVPs of this entire production, she has yeah. played three very different characters, and yeah, yeah, like really well done to her. Um, I. Mm-hmm. If I were to give a cast shout out in this episode, it would probably be to Bob Peck again because he kind of is the scene stealer always. He always is. Like and so, yeah, the two of them I think are definitely MVPs. Like, um, yeah. uh, again, just and they have great chemistry together when they're playing John and Fanny. Yeah, John and Fanny, like for the amount of scenes the two of them are really in together, sure, yeah, they they do, but like definitely not the focal point. But yeah. but yeah, they are just those are two pros who just. Mm-hmm. They, they are very well suited to this kind of show where yes. they play vastly different characters and are able yes. to kind of capture these vibes. And yeah, yeah and I, I just think while certainly of Bob Peck's two characters, one is very likable and one is very despicable, both of yeah. them just command the stage whenever they're there and are. Yeah. So uh, gotta, gotta continue shouting him out for that. And yeah. I don't know how much of him we'll see anymore. I kind of do think this might be the last we see of Hawk, but we'll probably see John again at some point. So even regardless Maybe. of whether or not, because, you know, John is basically, <laughs> he's kind of accepted his role as Nicholas's right hand man when he needs help punching people. <laughs> that's true. That's yeah. true. So there we go. That's that. But yeah, that's the ranking. Yeah. Um, like, I, I will just, to my kind of, thoughts about the mm-hmm. I, I i think this episode does the beginning middle and end kind of works here because we are mm-hmm. sort of while i don't feel like it necessarily picked up the batons that we were left with in the previous yeah. episode i think where we the cutting has happened kind of gives mm-hmm. us the whole sort of wedding plot line the dual yeah. plot line and the death of smike is all contained within this episode yeah, the, exactly. the, the wedding was obviously started in the previous episode but we yeah. get like you know, the whole points of drama all pay off here. And yeah, yeah and that's why I kind of put it third to last because, not because it, like I say that kind of as a compliment to this context, because the only two episodes that follow it are the only two that I really don't feel like followed yeah. the beginning, middle, and end. Like the, yeah. the one day more episode, I thought this is just such an unsatisfying ending to not just this episode, but the whole first play. Yeah. <laughs> and then this episode seven, the previous episode, I thought, this is all just nonsense. <laughs> so, so this episode... That's the, yeah. I, that's the thing I feel about episode three, was that it, it, it is... The episode good. three is still my number two, and I think that was the most coherently structured episode. Like, uh, I, I, yeah, I, no. I still I, I think... I didn't find enough the, happened in that episode. I thought that was a very meandering episode. It was me- meandering, but I think it did dramatic structure-wise, I think that one had the hardest job and pulled it off the best, which is why I still put mm-hmm. that in my number two. Episode yeah. two is still, I think, the strongest single episode because that punch kind of just perfect climax to yes. that episode. Like, agreed. Before we realized that this is just something that Nicholas just does all the time. Back then, it felt <laughs> special. <laughs> well, I think I, I think now we get why the poster has been Roger Reese throwing a punch. Yeah, for yeah I, I think that now yeah. makes sense. <laughs> yeah, of why that is. Mm-hmm. Okay. Anything? Last thoughts before we call it? This has been a feel like a long one, but I think these are getting increasingly longer as we're getting closer to the well, end because there's more yeah. to talk about. Yeah. Yes. Uh, no, I think that is it for me for this episode. Uh, I'm very excited to see how they wrap up the end of this yeah. uh, 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 nine-part adventure that's been keeping us going for the last nine weeks or so. Yeah. And, like, I feel like our next final episode of the series is one it'll be an appraisal of the episodes we've, all, we've always done but it's also I would to, like us to do a 10th episode where we do we'll get to watch talk the, about that. The, the, the Channing Tate the, the Charlie Hunnam Not movie Channing version Tate. with Jim Broadbent <laughs> uh, yeah well we'll talk about it later but I do think yeah, yeah. what I was going to say is our next episode in addition to being the you know let's appraise yeah. this episode it will also have to be the appraisal of the entire series so expect yes. that to be a long one <laughs> yes very true very true But there we go, everybody. That is it. Uh, We will see you all next week with our final installment, potentially. Maybe there's a a surprise. It'll be our final installment of this RSC production. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Until then, everybody. Cheers. Stay healthy. Stay safe. Bye. Bye.